Okay, thank you all for being here. I'm Barbara, this is Ansel, and we're gonna talk about graphics. This talk is really about graphics, but what we wanna make sure we do is define what graphics are. It's not just 2D, it's not just 3D, it's also text. And we're gonna say that a lot of times, text is graphics. And we wanna talk about why this is so important. Before we get started, we just wanna tell you a little bit about who we are. Ansel and I are the co-founders of the Copper Spice Project, and it is a set of GUI libraries. We also have several other libraries as um, part of the suite. Many of these libraries are used in Copper Spice. We also develop DoxyPress, which is a replacement for Doxygen that really supports all the templates and everything you need in C++. One of the founding principles of the Copper Spice project is that everything we do is open source, and we use the most modern C++ technology we can. So what are graphics, or what is graphics? And I really like this sentence that we put together. Graphics are responsible for displaying images and text in a way which is effective and meaningful to the consumer. If you have an application that has graphics and the consumer can't figure out what you're saying or what they need to respond to, it's not effective and it doesn't help them. Now, when we start digging a little deeper into graphics, you'll find that it's really divided into two fundamental categories. We have raster graphics, which is where you have a bitmap image that has a bunch of individual pixels. And since this is resolution dependent, the resolution is baked into the bitmap, you can't scale without loss of quality. On the other hand, we have vector graphics, which is actually describing an image using coordinates that form shapes. This is usually used as a sequence of drawing commands that draw something. This really ought to be processed on the GPU because it takes a lot of work to render. But the really nice property of vector graphics is that when you scale them to a different size, since all you're doing is scaling coordinates, the image quality isn't compromised. We did three videos. We have a YouTube channel, YouTube slash Copper Spice. We hope you'll take a look at that. It's a lot of C++ videos and various other videos about our libraries. We did three videos earlier this year. They talk about the evolution. These are really fun videos. We, we had fun putting it together. If you're interested in the timeline, where has graphics started, where has it gone? These are a great overview. But let's take a moment as we look at where we are today to look at where we've come from in terms of monitors. 15, 20 years ago, if you looked around at an office, everyone would have a VGA monitor on their desk. This is 640 by 480, about 300,000 pixels. This was typical. These days, most machines are 1080p. It's not uncommon to have 4K. This laptop has a 4K screen on it, and it's about three years old. That's 8 million pixels. 8K monitors are on the horizon. You can buy one now for about $4,000. And of course, as hardware always does, this will drop in price and these will become more common. An 8K monitor has 33 million pixels that will need to be updated every time the screen is refreshed. That's a lot of work. Now, why does this matter to us? Because if we're rendering on the CPU, this is complicated. A CPU has four to eight cores, a really high-end one might be 20. And you normally want to run one or two threads on each core for maximum efficiency. The CPU is really not designed to process data at this kind of parallel scale. Whereas a GPU, they're typically at least 1,000 cores. This laptop, as I mentioned, that's three years old, has almost 3,000. It's common to get them up to four or 5,000 now. As well, these GPUs are hyper-threaded, which means in order to get maximum performance, you need to have 5, 50, 60, sometimes hundreds of threads running on each core, which means we need a way that allows us to start hundreds of thousands of threads to render an image on your screen. So the gaming industry really drove graphics 
And this is really good. The, the gaming industry said, we need hardware that is better. And the hardware vendors listened. And so this really changed hardware. The problem is the tools haven't kept up. For desktop applications, we need a way to now leverage the GPU that is sitting there, rather bored, rather empty. So we're very grateful to the gaming industry. But you made us more work. That's really nice. So for desktop applications, what about high DPI? That's really text. We have forgotten text. It's fallen off the wayside. We also want fonts that have smooth scrolling and that look nice. And again, in the gaming industry, it's not so much text-based. It's 2 and 3D and it's fancy stuff. But we want to make sure, again, we include the text. And how are we going to do this? We've got this very bored GPU, and everybody's over here working on the CPU. Most every library is concentrated on doing text on the CPU. It's a waste. So we're going to do something that's always exciting. We're going to show a demo. We're going to stop the slides. We're going to bring up a demo. Ansel's going to do that in a second here. It's C17. CMake 3.8. It also uses SDL2. You don't have to use this library. You can use GLUT and a couple of the others that get interesting to pronounce. The purpose of SDL2 is just for the windowing. And it's just going to handle some of the keystrokes. So, Maestro, have a demo. So, the purpose of this demo is to show what rendered graphics looks like. There's a pot, there's a table, there's a salt and pepper shaker. The table and the tabletop are actually separate. If you're into graphics and you know, these are meshes. The text you're seeing in here is a chalkboard, and the chalkboard is to simulate a GUI application. There's text down here that's wiggling and moving. What's interesting is the text on the chalkboard looks flat. That's because of its projection. The text that's wiggling looks 3D. They're both 3D. This is rendering 3D text. And there's no magic here. This is just a library and a demo that is rendering everything. So what I'm going to have Ansel do is press some keys. And let's zoom in on the word demo. We're moving the camera closer. So let's take a look. This is a simulation of enlarging. It's not actually even a simulation. That's demo, and we've essentially showing high DPI by moving the camera. Pretty interesting text. It looks very readable. Let's go a little sharper, and, a little closer, and see if it's still sharp. We're looking at the corners. We're looking at the edges. That's what you want to look at. So we're showing how fonts scale. And this is rendered on the GPU. So let's talk about how we're doing this. Because that's what's really interesting. The demo worked. We won. <laughs> the demo program actually isn't that big. It's a CPU with 60, uh, C, a, C, a CPP file, 60 lines. We have a header file. None of this is that exciting. It's rather small. And again, we said it links with SDL2. We have some resources, some meshes we put in there. What's what? behind it is CS Paint. CS Paint is our graphics library. It's available under an open source license. And what CS Paint does is encapsulate the Vulkan API and give you a higher level abstraction for working with rendering things on the GPU. And one of the cool things about it is it uses the C++ bindings to Vulkan. Not many people even know that exists, but it's part of the Vulkan SDK. We started this process with the C bindings, and it was painful, as you might expect. And then Barbara discovered, well, why aren't you using the C++ bindings? And I said, wait a minute, there were C++ bindings provided? When did that start? Not too long ago. Yes. Yes. So you had to rewrite part of the library. 
Yes, yep. that, was, that was interesting. But it was well worth it because the C++ bindings are better. We also use GLM, which is a library for linear algebra. It's also open source and it's bundled with CS Paint. So the only external dependency we have is the Vulkan API itself. So as you decide you want to take a look at CS Paint, um, all the source for CS Paint, the demo, everything is available. It's all on GitHub. It's all open source. And if you're sitting there going, well, I would like to do something other than a pot, you'll want to start with the demo and take a look at everything. That's the way to get started. Since Vulkan is available on every major current desktop and mobile platform, CS Paint will run natively pretty much everywhere. On uh, Apple platforms, you'll want to use Molten VK, which is the Vulkan wrapper that converts the Vulkan calls to metal calls. Using CS Paint means you don't have to do quite as much of the really tedious and repetitive API work that Vulkan requires. It was required. tedious? Yeah, and repetitive. Constantly? Yes. Got it. Continuously tedious. And repetitive. Yes. Yeah. A lot of work you did again and again. Instead, you can spend your time where it's most valuable, which is working on your shaders and designing your scene and rendering your application. Cool. So why did we choose Vulkan? Because it's the right choice. OpenGL has been around for a long time. And in OpenGL, there are some limitations. And Vulkan is newer, and it is closer to the metal. And with Vulkan, you get more control. And again, these are some of the tools to help you really leverage what's available. And the bottom line is, there's more work. OpenGL, more things were done for you. In Vulkan, as the developer, you have to do more of it yourself. And we'll talk more in detail about some of these things, but Vulkan has no built-in memory management. So the amount of work you have to do to get anything to show up on the screen is much larger than it was in OpenGL. However, Vulkan applications make much better use of the hardware resources available. So let's take a look at just the code. It's two slides. This is the demo. It is C++-like. Um, it is C++ code. You may not recognize some of the calls, but this is the entire initialization. Now, I will say a lot of these calls are making calls into CS Paint and doing lots of stuff behind the scene. But this is the entire setup. You want to play with the demo? That's what you use. Oops. And this is the entire event loop. We've left out the code in the key processing because that is just processing uh, the plus and minus keys and when he was rotating the pot and moving in the camera. So this is it. That's the demo. And rather than going into detail, our purpose of showing you this is so that you can see this is really just C++ code, calling a natural modern C++ API rather than a whole bunch of manual work dealing with resources. So what's underneath CS Paint, like we said, is Vulkan. And this screen is showing you a list of terms. And if you decide, well, I don't want to use CS Paint, I'm really tough, I can do it. This is what you would need to do. Anybody who is like trying to draw a triangle in Vulkan? Anybody still breathing? Good, okay. It's about a thousand lines of code. It is not simple just to do a triangle. And you really need to know all of this. And if you don't, you're pretty much looking at a black screen. I give you a hint, when you lock up the GPU, it is a cold reboot. And that happened multiple times a day. So this is a lot of terminology, and you would need to know all of it. What we want to do is just talk about a few of these so you can see what's underneath CS Paint. So let's start at the very beginning of a Vulkan program. The first thing you do is create an instance. This is actually a handle that you allocate at the very beginning. This is the connection between your application and the Vulkan library or driver on your platform. And every other call that you will make uses either the instance or something derived from the instance. Usually you only need one of these. It's kind of similar to the context that was in OpenGL, except the context isn't actually an object. It's just sort of implicit in the OpenGL API. You will also need a surface. 
Now, a surface is a place on the screen where your output will show up. And since that's very platform specific, there's a set of platform specific extensions that are shipped with Vulkan that implement how to allocate and work with surfaces. You also need to deal with the memory heap. Actually, I should say a memory heap, because as C++ programmers, we're used to a single heap. But in Vulkan, you have many different heaps that all have different properties. They may only be able to store certain kinds of buffers. Some of them live on the GPU. Some of them live on the CPU. And you have to explicitly allocate memory for every buffer that you want and then bind the buffer to it. And this can get very complex, just selecting which heap should be used to allocate any given buffer. So there's a vertex buffer and a uniform buffer. And the vertex buffer contains the vertices. So if you were drawing a triangle, you would have three vertices, and those points would be in there. If you're doing a mesh, like the copper pot or the table, you could have thousands, which is why you don't want to create those meshes by hand. It's very complicated. A uniform buffer is used to say, I want to uniformly change every vertice that was in the vertex buffer. One of the easiest examples is I'm displaying something here and I want to transform it and move it left or right or up or down. So I want to apply some altercation of moving on an X and a Y or a Z axis. And I want to do it to every single point. So yes, you have to set up these buffers all yourself, especially if you're just using Vulkan directly. Then the next term that you really need to be familiar with, even if you're using CS Paint, is a shader. And a shader is nothing more than a callback that runs on the GPU. It's a small program written in some specialized language that's designed for the GPU. If you've used OpenGL, you've probably used a language called GLSL. Or Direct3D, people will be familiar with HLSL. These are different flavors of shading languages. Well, Vulkan gives you your choice, because it actually doesn't use either of those. It uses a compiled representation called Spear V, and there are compilers that will accept either GLSL or HLSL and produce the Spear V that you need. There are several different categories of shaders that run at different parts of the rendering process, and each one is responsible for a different function, piece of functionality in the rendering process. So graphics. Let's talk about some of the really interesting details. I'm going to assume that you're the camera. And we're going to talk about winding direction, because this is really important. So if you were looking at the windings, normally a winding goes in a clockwise direction. So you could change it, but that is the normal way. So if you're drawing a triangle, it is going to draw the vertices in a clockwise direction. That means that as the camera looking, everything that is drawn clockwise, that is front facing. The things on the back, the back facing, are counterclockwise. This comes into play and it's really helpful when we start talking about culling. Culling on means don't draw the back side. And if you've done any graphics, you've realized, I don't need the backside of a building or the backside of the moon because you're the camera, you're looking at the front. So here's what happened to us. We had our windings, they were going clockwise. Perfect. We had calling off. We were drawing a triangle. This will be incredible. And nothing drew. A black screen. Ansel was doing this part of the library, I was doing the research. And he goes, I'm really good at Googling. And he goes, could you Google Vulcan black screen? <laughs> Surprisingly, there's a lot of hits. Because a lot of people end up with a black screen. The problem is, when you Google for Vulcan, nothing shows up. None of those solve your problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I persisted, and it was quite interesting. After reading several things and fire hosing him with information, and then Ansel said, wait a second. For some reason, he's really good at linear algebra. And he said, I know, I'm sure I messed up the linear algebra somewhere internally. So he's digging out books and he's looking through everything. I'm trying to Google and he's trying to study linear algebra. 
It was a pretty loud office for a couple days. And then I said, wait a second. We took some examples from OpenGL and put them in Vulkan. Could that be the problem? Ah, for those of you that are already two steps ahead of me. Between OpenGL and Vulkan, they flipped the y-axis. This means, of course, you think your triangles are in clockwise order, but they're actually counterclockwise because everyone has been inverted. So we turned off the culling and the triangle came up because we were no longer culling and we thought, now the backside, it was a triangle, it was flat. So we had actually said, hey, turn on culling and don't draw anything that is counterclockwise. The y-axis flipped, it was counterclockwise. This is actually really hard to say when you're doing pair programming, but we muddled through it. It turns out there's a setting in GLM, our other library that we're, we're linking with, that is supposed to only be doing the, um, giving us some of the containers, some of the vector containers. But there's a setting that says, hey, I know it's flipped, I'll take care of this for you. So you can just program any way you want and GLM says, I'll flip the y-axis in the background, invisible. That works much better. That was a week of my life. So, fantastic, we have a data flow. Now I know how everything works. Okay, let me tell you how Vulkan works. Here we go. There are descriptors with descriptor sets, descriptor pools, and there's a couple other descriptor things. Face culling, windings, don't forget your axis, flip it, do it right. Okay, then I need a vertex shader, a fragment shader, a geometry shader, a tessellation shader, they all go into the pipeline. Now I've got a pipeline. Now I've got to set up a vertex buffer, the uniform buffer, take that, feed the pipeline into the command buffer, don't forget my draw commands, how am I doing? Pretty good so good. far. Good, excellent. Everything goes into the command buffer, which is on the CPU. Now I've got to take this, submit this to the graphics queue, which is on the GPU, and then it will automatically go to the frame buffer, and presto, it will all show up on the screen. I can have coffee. Not so fast. What did I do? Did you forget your swap chain? Crap. I forgot the swap chain. The swap chain goes in the command buffer, right? Yes. Just a swap chain. So now I've got the swap chain, and then it's going to display on the screen. Coffee? Well, make it a long coffee. A long coffee. Because if you come back and touch the vertex buffer and the uniform buffer too soon, it'll mess things up. I can't touch those? How am I going to make sure I don't touch anything and that it's ready to go on the frame buffer? Well, you did remember to set up a fence, right? Crap. There are fences. There are barriers. Ah, but there are fences on the command buffer, which is on the CPU, and there are semaphores on the GPU. And I can only query things on the CPU. I can't really talk to the GPU. I'm doing really well. Yes? OK, great. So now I've got these fences. I've got these barriers. This is insane. Why don't I just set up two things? Maybe like two command buffers? No, you don't need two command buffers. I don't no. need two command buffers? Well, that might be a good idea. Probably is one. two the right number? Well, three would be better. Three command buffers. Three command buffers. Wait a second, how many pipelines? Can I ever use two pipelines? Well, you might want to. Do we, we use two pipelines? Yeah, in the demo. Great, we use two pipelines. One set of pipelines because we have shaders that draw the mesh, and we use another set of shaders that draw the text. So I've got two pipelines, I should have three command buffers. So now I need six command buffers? No, only three. Only three command buffers. How will the pipeline and the draw commands know which way to go for which set of shaders? Because you have to specify the pipeline for each draw command. Okay, so I forgot to set in the pipeline. Where are my scissors? I think well, I forgot that in the initialization in the descriptor pool. Yeah, I think And you where did. the memory management so has. And up, the initialization. I am exhausted. And now everything's going to draw. Yeah. But if I do change the vertex buffer and the uniform buffer too soon, I screw everything up. Yep. So I got to watch that. I got to watch my fragment shaders. I got to watch my draw commands. This is exhausting and tedious. And repetitive. Better way? Let's use CS Paint. Let's use CS Paint. Let's not do it. If you really want to see how repetitive this is, please try it. Glass of wine, beer, coffee. Beverage of choice, soda pop. But that's what's happening, and we've left things out. But that's what's happening in Vulcan. And it's a lot. And I am really tired. 
Let's talk about CS Paint. Graphics, GUI. So we wanted the idea of putting the graphics back in GUI. Now, this seems kind of ridiculous, because doesn't the G in GUI stand for graphical? Yes, it does. That's what it originally meant. And we've forgotten about it. We've forgotten that text is graphics. So let's go ahead and talk about the really cool part about this. How do we do the text? Because that's the part that nobody has handled in this way. And we showed twisting text. And we showed text that looked flat. It's your imagination of how the text looks. But let's talk about what's behind it, because this is what's really, really cool. This particular screen is just a screenshot from a Windows application. Looks kind of nice. It's a 16-point monospace font. And it was one, one of my computers. I can read it. Pretty much everybody can read it. What we thought about is, how good does it really look? And this is rasterization generated on the CPU. So we decided to blow it up. And that's the word demo. This is what you have in your GUI applications if you're using pretty much any library, doesn't matter which one, that's doing everything on the CPU. That's what it looks like. So this is increased by 1,400%. And that's a little more than you'll see in most current monitors. But this is coming. With an 8K monitor, this won't be uncommon. And this is what you get if you scale the text up after rasterization. And that's actually fairly common if your operating system or some library is doing the scaling for you in an application. And you can read this, but it's hard on the eyes. It looks terrible. Now, as a reminder, what did this look like in our demo application when we zoomed the camera closer to the chalkboard? It looked like this. This is obviously better. So this was rendered on the GPU with CS Paint. We think it's better. It's our opinion. There, it, it just looks clean. We've chosen letters that were round and square and have corners. This is a lot better. So it'd be really nice to have our GUI applications. And keep in mind, if you have an application that puts anything on the screen, again, that's text and the consumer is going to see it. I'd rather this. Because if the application is trying to do high DPI at the rasterization level, it's going to mess up. It gets some of it right. But if the high DPI value is a fraction and not a power of two, most applications can't handle it. And most often, they use scaling factors. We actually tried this in Copper Spice. We've actually looked at that. We can get it right here, but not at this size. So this is what we're going to. Now, why is this a fair comparison? Because people say, oh, well, I zoom in on DPI-aware applications, and they look fine. So the first example we showed is scaling up text on the CPU after rasterization. It doesn't take that much memory. It's efficient to do. But the quality is terrible, as you saw. Most current applications that are DPI aware scale the user interface by rasterizing the font at a higher resolution. This takes a lot of memory, and it can be really slow. You get good results, but the performance is just unacceptable in most modern uh, machines. What we're doing is rendering text on the GPU at a higher DPI. It takes the same amount of memory, the same amount of resources, no matter what size you're scaling the text to, and the quality always remains crisp. And we do this by doing a lot of work in a fragment shader to actually generate the shape of the letter. So let's talk about the steps that it takes to do this. So we're going to take the word demo, four letters, D-E-M-O. So we're going to need a rectangle. So we're going to count how many and make a rectangle. It's not actually a rectangle. It's two triangles. So for every letter, we have a location where it's going to go. And then we use a process that is just a texture. And if you're not familiar with the texture, 
if you were doing graphics and you had a table and you wanted it to have a marble surface or a wood grain surface, the way you actually do it is you apply a texture. You don't just make a marble table. It's the same way with a ball. You could actually have a texture that is an image of the moon and you just put it on a sphere and then you have a moon or a soccer ball. So we're gonna do the same thing to render text on the GPU. We're gonna apply a texture to a rectangle. This texture isn't a simple image though. It's not actually a literal image of what the text looks like. <clears throat> Instead it contains a very distorted font image. You can generate this from any normal font file and in the fragment shader, we're going to use the data in this font texture to compute the high resolution outline of the font using an algorithm called a multi-channel sign distance field. And what this actually does is it treats the three different color channels in the texture as three independent tables of information. And we'll show you more about how that works. All the heavy lifting, all the complex parts of this are already built into CS Paint. So this is the image. You can take any font, and we have the scripts as part of CS Paint. We just happen to use the Deja Vu Sans Mono font. We took it and we ran it through the script, and this is the image. And this is Latin 1, and you can actually make out some of the letters. I know it looks peculiar. It's not actually color. But again, the colors are just the different channels that represent a value we're going to use. And notice previously we said we were rendering a particular string at, at Deja Vu Sans Mono 16. This is just Deja Vu Sans Mono. There's no font size here. This one font texture is valid for any size you might want to render this font. This is the only one you'll ever need for this particular font face. And you can see sort of a regular grid of information here, and you can see the letters that these are based on. But this does look quite odd, doesn't it? And the size? The wonderful thing about this is how much memory does this use? It looks pretty low resolution. It turns out that by a happy coincidence, this image is exactly 640 by 480. This is 300,000 pixels. This does not take any more information than an old VGA monitor for any font you want to render. So how do we do this? As I said, we have this rectangle that is actually two triangles. What we did is we captured the capital letter D so that you could really see what it looked like. So that bizarre looking thing is gonna be our texture. And we're going to put it as a texture onto this rectangle. What we're really trying to do with this multi-channel sign distance field algorithm is ask, is a particular pixel in the rectangle and outside of the body of the letter D or inside the body? And if it's clearly outside, that's off. If it's clearly inside, it's on. But how do we do the smoothing and the gradient at the edges? And if you're familiar with just the sign distance field algorithms, which gives us one value, those are not as accurate. This multi-channel, we're going to use three distances to figure out every single pixel. And I'm sure somebody's saying, my god, this is going to be slow. It's actually not. Again, we got to keep that very bored GPU really busy. It turns out, as you saw in the demo, this is insanely fast. Now, if you'll notice, when we actually zoom in on one letter, there's very little information here. This is 48 by 48 pixels. And yet we're able to produce a nice crisp outline at any resolution using just this much data. So how do we do that? So this is the fragment shader that renders the text. It's written in GLSL, all the source code is in the demo. And this particular fragment shader receives some inputs from the vertex shader that have been computed, like the texture coordinates. And it receives one input from the uniform buffer. And every fragment shader is responsible, for, is responsible for producing one output. That output indicates what color should this pixel be. And for our purposes, we want to know, is this pixel inside the body of the letter, in which case it's on or black or white or whatever you're doing in, the, in this particular font, is it outside or is it in the transition area? And if it's in the transition area, we need to decide how dark it is. So first we're going to set up a smoothing constant. This just sets the, the band 
of smooth shading around the letter. This is hard-coded here. This could easily be computed based on the screen resolution. And we're also going to set up a function that just takes the median of three numbers. Nothing too complex here yet. This is the entire shader. We're omitting the piece that actually computes the color because that's not relevant for this, but this is all it takes to determine whether a given pixel is inside or outside the body of the letter. So let's walk through this line by line. The first thing we do is do a texture sample. This it takes the texture coordinates that were computed in the vertex shader and the thing called a font sampler, which is really just a reference to the texture that we're using. And this looks up in the texture at a given point to say, what are the red, green, and blue values at this point? And it's going to be interpolated because the point we're asking for might be between some pixels in the texture. Remember, the texture is quite low resolution. This sounds complicated, but in fact, this is something GPUs are really optimized very well for because this is something that's done all the time in any 3D scene. So then we take those three red, green, blue values and we simply take the median. This is not a complicated operation. We're just comparing a few numbers. That median gives us a distance. And the distance tells us how far we are from the edge of the letter shape. Then we use the smooth step function, which simply gives us a nice smooth transition between on and off at the edge of the letter to indicate how opaque each given pixel is. If it's almost completely transparent, we discard it because we don't care about drawing those. And then we compute the output color just by looking at the output color we wanted that was passed in from the vertex shader and modifying that by how, how much of the letter is present at this pixel that's represented by the opacity. That's all it takes. That was the whole fragment shader. It's using this multi-channel sign distance field. It is, by the way, an algorithm we found. We, we knew about the sign distance field. It was the multi-channel that was so exciting for us. It is a PhD paper. It's all open source. If anybody really wants to study the math, we can point you to where you can find that information. But it is what makes the difference. We looked at some outputs of all the different algorithms out there, and it is quite stunning that by using three points to figure out if a given pixel should be on or off, it really makes a lot of difference. Because again, if we're going to go to the GPU, we really want to keep it busy and make this really clean and crisp so our users see exactly what they want on the screen. Are there any questions about the fragment shader before we move on? Did we do a good job? Apparently so. <laughs> Any questions? Hard to see. There'll be a quiz later. <laughs> so underneath all this, we said we're using the Vulkan API. There are various versions of the Vulkan API. What we're suggesting is you use the one from Lunar G. The reason why is it's the most widely used, it's the most widely supported. It also comes with all the tools that you need to do the Spear V output of the shaders, and it also comes with the various abstraction layers. There's not a lot of debugging that's really available when you're working in Vulkan, but there's a few. Actually, it just produces an output you have to sit and read. It's actually a little harder than reading uh, template errors. It's actually quite painful. Um, and we've done all that work for you. And if you're curious about who Lunar G is and what their position is in the Vulcan ecosystem, you might want to take a look at this YouTube video. It's a very nice little 10 or 15 minute introduction into just why Lunar G is present in the Vulcan API and, and why theirs is the most commonly used SDK for developing Vulcan applications. So if you want to take a look at everything, you install the SDK. Lunar G, Vulkan SDK, and then you go to GitHub and you clone the repo and you have CS Paint, start with the demo and make some beautiful changes, develop a new shader, and then you do a pull request and our demo gets better. How was that for a sales pitch? Sounds good. It's good. It's good. Okay. 
These are some tutorials. And the reason why we wanted to supply a list of tutorials is there is a lot of information on the internet. And I know the internet is a wonderful place and everything is really accurate. No, it's not. There's a lot of really bad examples on the internet. We, we know there's other ones than just these, but these are really good tutorials for anybody who's really interested in the underlying stuff, or those of you who would like to contribute to um, CS Paint directly. You're gonna wanna understand how Vulkan works. So these are some really good sites that you can take a look at. We also wanted to note that although there are a lot of different tutorials on Vulkan out there, many of them don't cover the C++ API at all. And some of these actually mention and show some examples of how to use the C++ API rather than just the C bindings. Modeling, as, as we talked about, the pot, the table, the salt and pepper shaker, everything is about text. And when you're doing text, there is no modeling involved in that because all of that rendering is done with the fragment shader and the texturing. But if you do need to do some modeling and you want to put that in your program, I would suggest using Blender. We did a little research. It's not the only one out there, but um, the 2.8 version of Blender is a really nice open source application. It is a bit complicated if you've never created a mesh. So if you'd like a really fun tutorial, take a look at Blender Guru. He's a character. I believe he's from Australia or New Zealand, somewhere down under. Really funny guy, very informative. He has a nine part series and he talks how to render a donut and a cup and a plate and a table. And it's a donut with pink frosting and sprinkles and that sounds kind of funny, but what it takes to make it really look like a donut with frosting and sprinkles coming on. It will take you a while to go through the nine parts. And he then stops and he says, let me show you what never to do. One of the things we got from his stuff was how to put the handles on the copper pot, not trivial. Um, but it was quite fun. So I would suggest looking at that if you're looking for a way to do meshes. So where are we going with this? Well, version of CS Paint 100 was released in September. So we're pretty new on this. But everything you saw actually works. We're not faking any of it, it's, it's all there. But there's more we want to do. One of the things we're considering is adding harf buzz. And you might say, well, I don't know what harf buzz is. It's for text shaping. If you've ever used an Android or you've ever used Firefox, you have used harf buzz. The author of harf buzz is in the United States. I believe he's up in Oregon now or Washington, instead of Washington. Really nice guy. We actually use the harf buzz library, the very newest version in Copper Spice for text rendering. We are considering adding it and, um, to CS Paint so that we can do some text shaping. We also want to enhance the library so that you can create these distance field textures on the fly for any given true type font. Right now it's an offline process. There's no reason that can't be in the library, but that simply hasn't been implemented yet. We also, one of the other libraries we have is CS String. CS String is a Unicode aware library. It is a drop-in replacement for STD String. Right now we have two policy classes in there to generate UTF-8 and UTF-16. So our String class in Copper Spice is already our QString class is a type def for QString 8. So we already have all of that built in. If you're just doing a regular C++ application, you can use CS String. And we want to take some of the qualities in CS String, combine it with CS Paint, so that you can just use those pieces in your standard C++ application. Ultimately, we have a higher goal. We want all of this in Copper Spice so that all text in Copper Spice is rendered using CS Paint. And then we said, wait a minute, why aren't the widgets? Why isn't everything in Copper Spice? The table view, the push button. So we have an idea of how to use some really interesting stuff to go in, gut out the internals of Copper Spice in our GUI library and hook into CS Paint. So automatically, on any platform that supports Vulkan 1.1, which is pretty much all of them, and it's by default we should be using Vulkan. 
We may do a, a fallback. It, it seems like a good idea to do a fallback. We're not sure if that's the right choice yet, so we're still contemplating that. Because again, most platforms do support a, a version of Vulkan that we can work with. And as we mentioned previously on OS 10, we can use Molten VK to support the Vulkan API directly. So here's where you can find it. Uh, we do have some documentation. Um, the documentation is at its early stages. It is API documentation. Um, of course, it's generated with DoxyPress. What else would we use? Um, we don't have all the API information broken out, but one of the things we did do is we took all the definitions of all the Vulcan terms, and we've already put that in the documentation. It's a repository and uh, where you can find everything. Um, everything we do, like I said, is on GitHub. If you want to look at the source code for Copper Spice, for CS String, for CS Paint, um, everything is there. We give everything away. And since we have a few moments, it looks like we have some bonus material. Unless there's, did, did all of this make sense? Are there any questions? We are just absolutely stunning. Oh, a question. Yes. Microphone. Um, so the question is um, about this comparison between fonts that were rasterized on CPU and the one you showed in the demo that, well, the, I think we all agree that the quality is much better with mm -hmm. uh, GPU render fonts, but have you considered um, mo mo mobile platforms and that uh, GPU rendering doesn't come for free? It's more uh, power consuming. Um, usually than, uh, than CPU rasterizing. So doesn't it influence badly the, the, the um, battery consumption, uh, or could it uh, influence badly the, the battery consumption on mobile devices? That's an excellent question. And it turns out that although I understand your question, the intuition is actually inverse of reality in this case, because the GPU is actually significantly more efficient per pixel rendered than the CPU is. Particularly with Vulkan, OpenGL had a lot of overhead, and so GPU operations got a bad reputation on mobile platforms. But if you're rendering using Vulkan and you can actually keep the GPU busy, or rather very efficiently turn on the GPU just for the period of time you need, you actually get much better performance per watt on mobile platforms when you're doing as much as possible on the GPU. Any other question? Very interesting party. <laughs> yeah. Hi, yes. uh, thanks a lot. It, um, it, it's very eye-opening to realize the, that the GPU might be use, useful for much more. I have a question. Suppose I'm, I want to integrate it into a system that's already using Vulkan, for example. Mm -hmm. Did you wrap, I, so CS Paint wraps the Vulkan API. Is there some way that I can get back into the details of Vulkan, for example, so I can use it for the rest of my code that's already using Vulkan? Or conversely, can I give it an, uh, an initialized instance of a Vulkan, uh, the, like of the Vulkan system, and it can then uh, wrap around it without wanting to initialize it itself? You, you want to pass in the instance. That's an awesome pull request. <laughs> I like that. I'm not volunteering. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I just volunteered Ansel. <laughs> it, it turns out that most of what you it's, want is already there, depending upon the level that you're looking for. Um, CS Paint takes as one of its initialization parameters a Vulkan instance. And so you could use CS Paint in parallel with whatever you're already doing. That, that works out of the box. Um, you can also always, with any primitive in CS Paint, you can always get the underlying Vulkan handle. So if you're willing to do the resource allocation in CS Paint, you can always get the handle to that resource and pass it to any Vulkan API you like. We also know that in CS Paint, we defaulted several parameters. Um, and we've looked at it, it's like, should that be a default? Should we allow the user to overwrite? And that is something we're going to let other people drive up, to drive by saying, could you expose this? And we have no problem bringing things out so you can override. It was just a tough call of what does the user want to override? So that's why we're showing this, so people can tell us what we want. So we'd actually love to talk to you about your yes. specific use case and, and make sure that we can handle it. Um, <clears throat> so I have a question. I, there's one thing I don't understand about this multi-channel field. Yes. So if you have a letter, it's a vector graphics, right? So it can have arbitrary amount of detail somewhere. 
but this multi-channel field is then like 40 pixels by 40 pixels or something, right? So there must be some kind of limit uh, about how much detail in the letter you can represent, right? So do you like pre-compute how big this, this multi-channel field has to be to re accurately represent every detail of a particular glyph, or how does that work? That is a very perceptive question. <laughs> and the answer to that involves this item right here of creating the distance field textures on the fly. One of the things that we want to enhance is to add feedback to the process so that each individual glyph will be rendered using the number of pixels that are required for good quality outlines on that glyph. Right now you would need to take whatever font and run it through the scripts and generate that 640 by 480 image. And we know that ultimately that doesn't make sense because all of a sudden you're going to need to use a font on the fly. Okay, M many thanks for this very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, so the first one is, um, why is it currently limited to monospaced fonts? And the other question is, why don't you um, tessellate the, the font itself and render it directly as triangles? This would be the natural way for me to do it. It's very interesting to do it with this field. But yeah, give me maybe the reasoning for that. that that's Go really for. good, both of those questions. Um, for the first one, the reason the we the are limited space. to monospace is because we haven't yet integrated HarfBuzz. Yes. And so for full text shaping and kerning, it just requires a lot more information. And that's one of the things that HarfBuzz gives us for free. And, and that was one of the things trying to decide exactly where the library is going to go. And again, that's why we're here, is to find out what people need. And if everybody's saying, no, no, Latin 1 is fine, or we don't care about, you know, monospace, we get requests and it's like, actually now I think the, we need Harf Buzz. And um, like I said, we, we know the author, and he'll talk to anybody, which is wonderful. Um, he is a C programmer and he has changed some of the stuff. Um, he had some interesting errors, um, not understanding where C++ 17 was going. And we talked to him and he just changed it, which I think is quite amazing. He actually developed HarfBuzz um, because he is... I believe he's Persian. Persian. And, and his alphabet is a mess. Um, it's a gorgeous looking alphabet, but it was hard for tech shaping. His entire career he worked at couple different companies, um, that's what he does, is tech shaping for, for various um, large name companies. As to the <coughs> second part of your question of why don't we generate geometry for each individual glyph, and the answer is they can actually be quite complex. It turns out it takes a lot more memory to do that. And it turns out that on most um, current GPUs, the per fragment part of the pipeline has far more performance than the per vertex part. So you're usually geometry limited, not fill rate limited. And texture lookup is much better optimized than the amount of work we'd have to do in the vertex shader if we actually generated separate triangles for each component of a glyph. There was actually another library we were looking at for a while that does some of the shaping and it uses an analysis of Bezier curves. Problem is, one, it's closed source, and two, it's closed source and we're open source. So that was one of the problems. But the other problem is it's slow, um, which was very surprising. Uh, we've been doing research on this on, on and off all year, and it is amazing. You're going and you're going, oh wow, Bezier curves. That would be really fun to just say and use. It's not effective, I mean, it, it, not for speed. So this, this uses the parts of the GPU that are very highly optimized. Yes. Well, uh, uh, my question related to the resource allocation and sharing. If we have a CPU and like a restaurant, then we use the main memory and like if you use shared library, it automatically shared between the, all processes. What about uh, sharing the same like texture or resources between different processes by using the same buffer uh, in the GPU, it mo mostly for the GPU uh, architecture, but uh, how you can handle that? In terms of two GPUs on one system? If, if or you have like uh, uh, two processes, they both use the same texture, but you like to have uh, the one instance, one resource in the GPU. You usually only want one instance, and that insane diagram that I went through, that's totally tedious and exhausting, um, you can have multiple pipelines. So you can have different shaders, different pipelines. 
And actually, there is code in the library that if you have two GPUs, um, is, is that all working now for two GPUs on one? Yeah, it is working. It's working. Yeah, one of our testers, yes. And what about if you have two processes in multiple process systems? Uh, in um, multiple threads or? Multiple processes. Multiple processes. Threads. That's an area where you really can't share resources on the GPU across processes. Um, that's, it's, it's not well defined whether that would be a security boundary. And so uh, current drivers just don't allow that. OK, thank you. Oh, we have another question. Tim, turn around. Oh. <laughs> uh, hello. Yes. Uh, my guess is the uh, input textures with the distance field are uh, rendered on the CPU, uh, if I understand it correctly. The input textures with the distance the field textures. are CPU rendered. Yes. How much performance uh, does it require? Uh, how much uh, more complicated is it than uh, re regular text rendering for a similar resolution? Um. Can it be done in real time? So, actually generating the input yes. texture? Generating. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's an offline process, so its performance doesn't matter as much. It is a fairly complex process because you're looking at the, uh, essentially the curvature of each shape that is being rendered into the texture. But that's done completely offline ahead of time, so it doesn't um, have any impact on the performance of the actual drawing operation. Okay, but if I was to uh, render them uh, on the fly, if I, uh, for example, don't know the font which will be used, mm -hmm. uh, how, how much time is it required? Is it a scale of two times more, time, ten times more than rendering a regular text? One of, one of the things we can do on the rendering is to do, uh, we may not need to render all of it. We may not need to do the whole font. We can render the glyphs that you need. So again, that won't be that expensive. Um, it, if you do know the fonts, and it is something you can do ahead of time, obviously that probably is better. But we haven't seen any degradation at this point. Um, to, to give you a rough yeah. idea, to generate that texture image that you saw, which is all of Latin 1, is about 250 milliseconds. So it's not something you want to do every frame, certainly, but it's, it's not really noticeable in, in practical use. But I will say that if you're using everything and you're doing text this old-fashioned way and you're doing it on the CPU, pro part of the problem is now I need to load a 10-point font, a 12-point font, a 16-point font, a 22-point font, because for some reason I need all these fonts and all these different things. And one of the things we saw is there's a lot of swapping. So again, that's why we wanted to move everything over to the GPU. And I can understand that if it's going to be too slow, now we're back into another problem. But so far, everything we have tested and all the benchmarking we have done, it is extremely efficient. And now we've freed up our CPU to just hang out and cool off and, and just wait for processing that has to be done there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Uh, and what about Unicode support? How big the texture must be to handle all the Unicode characters? That's an excellent question. <laughs> and there are, of course, a lot of glyphs. And that's part of the creating the textures on the fly is we'll also want to make sure that we only generate chunks of the Unicode space that are used. And so that will end up being multiple textures, probably um, binned by the area of Unicode that you're using. All right. Um, Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering about how half uh, bus actually works. I'm assuming this is purely CPU. Do you know if it were possible to move that to the GPU? So you could do text shaping in the GPU. To do the text shaping in the GPU. Um, it is technically possible. I mean, the GPU is a general purpose computing device. But the amount of um, the Unicode standard that you need to do it is relatively large. You need large tables. Um, and it's font dependent, so you need to actually load the metadata from the font into the GPU. It's possible, but it's not clear it would be a win because it's not really the kind of task that GPUs are good at. Okay. Something all the way in the back. Do you want to? Uh... Oh, just hide that. Well, that's our YouTube channel. No, no, no. Back up. That's okay. Let people stare at it. 
Go back. There we go. We're exhausted. Hi, sorry, hello, one more question, please. Uh, yes. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Uh, the output in it looks great if you zoom in and uh, render big, beautiful text. Uh -huh. What does it look like if you render 14-point high text? 40, uh, like... 14 or smaller. So um, what does the small output look like? Well, keep in mind, we're not actually rendering a size of a font. We're just saying, put the word demo here, and we're just using coordinates. No, I Moving, understand that. So okay. what I'm wondering is what the output looks like if you want to write small text using this uh, 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 sign distance field. Oh, the sign distance field. If we had zoomed the camera in, it maintains the same clarity. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. Or, what or if or you out. zoom the camera out? Yeah, then it, it still maintains the same clarity. It still clarity. maintains. Yeah. Whether you zoom in or zoom out. OK, but yeah. uh, you haven't mentioned anything about uh, handling things like uh, anti-aliasing and stuff like that. Because uh, in the current reality, like the, the monitor DPI is not high enough uh, that you can just uh, ignore anti-aliasing alto altogether. And uh, if you look, if you are sitting next, right next to your monitor, you are going to see with like small fonts that everything is pixelated and uh, so on. So that's what I'm... The display we're showing here is not as clear as we would like. Um, Ansible's computer is a 4K and you're very welcome to come up um, after the presentation and look at it on a 4K monitor. I'm a little picky and I run a 1080p, 1080p monitor, I really funky eyes. Um, I really don't like 4K and 8K yet. Um, and it looks amazing on my monitor. That was why we took that image in the Windows program, because we were looking at some stuff and it was like, wow, this is amazing. How bad was the older stuff? And it was like, oh my God, just make it go away. So we're actually using some of this internally in the office. Um, we don't have any VGA monitors, so we really couldn't do any testing on a VGA. Um, but again, you're more than welcome to look at his monitor to, to zoom in and zoom out and see that clarity. Thank you very much. Here you go, YouTube. Thank you. Thank you.